Hello, my name's Vince Sheehan and today I'd like to talk about Bach's first book of the Well-Tempered Clavier. And I'd like to go through each of the 24 preludes and fugues, looking at how they're put together. Um, of course, the Well-Tempered Clavier, both books one and two, uh, are probably amongst the most important uh, classical works ever composed. And uh, Bach composed the first collection in 1722. Well, that's when he put them together anyway, uh, during his time at Curtin. And um, each prelude and fugue goes through each key. So we start with C major, then we have C minor, C sharp major, C sharp minor, uh, D major, D minor, etc. All the way up to B minor. And uh, indeed, the book two uh, was written perhaps about 20 years later. But for this video, I'm just concentrating on book one. Bach himself uh, said that these were pieces that uh, were composed for the profit and use of musical youth desirous of learning, and especially for the pastime of those already skilled in this study. These are pieces, really, which have a didactic uh, purpose. But that's not to take anything away from their supreme artistry, of course. Many of the, some of the preludes and fugues actually existed already in uh, different forms. But Bach got these together um, in 1722, and the rest is history. Prelude Number one is surely one of the most recognisable pieces of classical music ever written. Um, I've just got to play the first bars. so on and so forth. Um, a glorious chain of uh, broken chords. Um, so simple, you know, kind of a blank slate which to start this work. Um, we have uh, an opening idea, that arpeggiated C major chord, which then takes us to the dominant key, G major, as you'd expect, and then the second part of the prelude takes us back to C major. But then Bach includes an additional part where he takes us on a walk again from C major and eventually back to C major for a brief coda. And now to the C major fugue. And um, a fugue, of course, as has been said a lot of times, is more of a way of writing music rather than a set form. Although you do find in the 48 what you might call classic examples of fugue. Um, with an exposition, with the parts coming in, usually three or four um, voices coming in with the subject and the answer, which is the subject raised up a fifth usually in the dominant key, and then the development of the subject um, through various episodes alternating with new statements of the subject, which are developed in various ways and sometimes you might have a coda at the end. There are examples of the classic version of the fugue, the classic scheme of the fugue in the, in the 48, and indeed in the first book which I'm looking at today. But the first fugue isn't like that, actually. Um, the first fugue is in four voices, and it's what's called the stretto fugue. We have um, a fugue which is just purely entries of the subject overlapping what we call in stretto. So the fugue is just made up of this idea in various keys. And so on. Uh, but it's a real wonderful uh, piece, quite an achievement. And then the second prelude in C minor goes like this.
surely one of the most arresting uh, preludes. In binary form, with a lengthy coda. And you'll find many of the preludes in uh, book one are in binary form, which is the classic Baroque form. An A section, which takes you to the dominant, or if you're in the minor key, um, quite often to the relative major. And then there's the journey back to the tonic. The fugue in C minor is a classic example of a fugue. And I'm going to play a recording of this in its entirety. And I'm going to go through the different parts to help you. By the way, I've put down an overview of the form of each of the preludes and fugues uh, in the description below. So please look at those, particularly if you have a score. I've included the bar numbers. So this very famous fugue goes like this. And we start with the exposition. There's the first voice. Second voice comes in, in the dominant. We have a brief codetta here, which is a, like a linking passage. There we have the last voice in the exposition. Here we have the first episode. And then we have uh, a statement of the subject in the relative major. Second episode. The subject in the dominant this time. Third episode. You hear it's going through the keys. Back to the tonic. Here's the fourth episode. Last statement of the subject to the tonic. Brief coda. Here's the Picardy, the major chord rather than the minor chord. Um, so that's the classic scheme of a fugue. Notice how that initial idea... ...etc. is taken through a variety of uh, related keys um, via the connecting episodes uh, which modulate the music. The third prelude <coughs> is this joyful and exhilarating ride, again in binary form in C-sharp major, and it goes like this, the first few bars. Two-part counterpoint. And so on. The fugue uh, connected to this prelude is uh, an exhilarating uh, fugue. I love this one. Uh, I'll just play the first few bars. Second voice. Back to the um, third voice there. First episode. The music's going through the keys, sequence. Again, like the second fugue in C minor, this is very much in that classic fugue scheme uh, of uh, exposition, development with the various episodes and statements of the subject in uh, various uh, keys. Um, prelude 4 is um, a rather moving and beautiful prelude, again in binary form, uh, in C sharp minor, and uh, I think this is uh, rather wonderful, this one. You hear the imitation between each hand and the left hand. A lovely change here.
Really beautiful. And I have to say the fugue in C sharp minor is really a wonderful masterpiece. So profound. And this is not a regular fugue. Like fugue one in C major, this one in C sharp minor is not... Uh, it's not good to listen out for episodes here because they don't really signal the structure, the episodes. Um, but it's quite clearly structured by hearing um, the counter subjects, uh, which are revealed later in this fugue. We start with this idea. <laughs> So it's a lengthy exposition in this fugue. But then the second section is uh, not marked by an episode as such, but the introduction of a distinctive counter subject, which goes like this. It's running uh, quavers. <laughs> and there's another counter subject as well, which goes like this. so on and this uh, solemn stately yet hugely profound uh, fugue uh, comes to this wonderful climax where the the slow idea this slow subject uh, is heard in this stretto uh, with the third with the second counter subject the prelude in D major is this rather jolly tune again in binary form and the fugue is this, this rather wonderful French overture style piece. Actually, it isn't um, a textbook fugue. It's more of a fugetta. There's not a final statement of the subject in the tonic, a full statement of the subject anyway. But it's got this rather flamboyant uh, beginning. <laughs> I love the Glenn Gould uh, recording of this actually, it really kind of makes it sound incredibly pompous. Uh, the prelude in D minor is, uh, has this rather guitar-like or lute-like figuration. Uh, have a listen, like this. Imagine a guitarist doing that, you know. Again in binary form, is the B section, ready? journey goes back to the tonic. This has a lengthy coda as well, I think, this one. We go to the fugue then in D minor. And this is a classic scheme of a fugue. Uh, goes like this. Three parts. Second part. Third part comes in on the bass, there we go, and so on and so forth. Prelude 7 is an extraordinary prelude. Um, this prelude is really in three parts, it's a magnificent piece. Um, and this is the first example of Bach actually putting a fugue, in this case a double fugue, that's when you have um, two subjects which are to be developed played simultaneously in the exposition. This is an example of Bach using a fugue in the prelude. He does this a few times in book one. Um, we begin with uh, this rather kind of um, exploratory meandering idea. that gives way to this uh, sustained uh, idea we're full of suspensions and then that takes us into the uh, fugue itself uh, in the prelude remember well 
What's interesting about this fugue in this prelude is that other than it being a double fugue with two ideas developed simultaneously, the first idea is actually a version of that introductory idea. And the, the uh, second subject in this fugue is actually the sustained idea we heard already. So it's, this is an ingenious prelude, it really is. Um, absolutely terrific. We then have um, a more standard fugue. And then we come to the prelude in E flat minor. And this is a rather austere uh, saraband. Then the fugue uh, bark here switches to D sharp minor. And this might be um, a reference really to the title Well-Tempered Clavier. It seems that Bach is aiming for equal temperament in these pieces. Remember in Bach's day, um, certain keys wouldn't sound completely in tune. Whereas it seems that Bach seemed to be writing this uh, for an equal temperament or well-tempered uh, clavier as he puts it. This fugue in uh, D sharp minor again like the like number four in C sharp minor is uh, one of the irregular fugues where it's you have to kind of work the structure out um, doing a bit of detective work really looking at the texture rather than those episodes which usually provide the, the signposts. Uh, this fugue is very canonical. There's lots of canons going on throughout the throughout the uh, the piece. And um, listen out also in this fugue for the uh, subject being inverted. Um, so the subject in this fugue is like this. And then sometimes you hear it <coughs> inverted, um, like this. And so on. It's like the upside down, basically. So that's the thing about fugues. Um, in the development section, where we hear the different entries go through different keys, um, quite often um, the subject will be inverted or, uh, um, the, or the note values will be halved or they'll be pulled apart so they're longer, that's augmentation. Uh, very occasionally you might even find them back to front. Um, this is a great fugue, the uh, B sharp minor one, and it's one worth um, repeated listening. And... Um, Again, just a reminder, I've put the, uh, an overview of each of the preludes and fugues down below in the description. The prelude in E major is a very recognisable tune, and uh, indeed Bach used it before as the prelude uh, for his sixth French suite. And uh, it just, it, just to remind you, it goes like this. Again, it's in binary form. And the fugue is a standard uh, scheme fugue. In three parts. Uh, rather delightful. Fugue 10, which is in E minor, is a rather interesting prelude, actually basically a binary form prelude but then another piece a presto piece is added on at the end it starts like this
and then we have this toccata like uh, section, a little bit like the second prelude in C minor. The tenth fugue is the only uh, fugue in two voices, um, and it's quite a thrilling one as well. Second voice. First episode. The eleventh prelude is in F major. Again in binary form. The fugue in F major uh, is this dance-like idea. This is one of my favourite um, fugues. And this fugue has a counter exposition. That means we have the regular exposition where, in this case, we have the three voices coming in and then we have an extra statement um, of the, the subject in the tonic and dominant before we reach the first episode. And this goes like this. There's the answer. It's the third voice in the bass. F minor is rather solemn, perhaps music uh, to ponder the mysteries of life at night time. Again in um, binary form, as is most of the preludes. The twelfth fugue has a chromatic subject. And this is kind of a foretaste of the uh, 24th fugue, actually. They're, they're kind of similar. I don't think this is accidental. Um, and this goes like this. It's a rather wonderful fugue. so on. The uh, 13th prelude is one of my favourites um, in F sharp major. I just love that idea. Idea just comes back in the different keys uh, and I love it. Um, the 13th fugue in uh, F sharp major again uh, in a standard fugue form although we have um, a new uh, theme which comes in with the first episode which I'll just point out to you now. Three, three voices Second voice. Bass, third voice. Here's this new idea with the first episode. Did you hear that? It's an example of Bach. Um, gradually revealing uh, his riches throughout his fugues uh, sometimes, a bit like the uh, fourth fugue, it does a similar thing. Um, the 14th prelude in F sharp minor. Again, binary form with a short coda. The 14th fugue is uh, rather solemn in nature, but the scheme is rather standard. Um, goes like this.
Prelude 15 in G major is this virtuosic tour de force. <laughs> Fugue is uh, one of my favourites. Um, listen out in this one for the uh, subject, which is inverted. Um, the subject would go like this. And so on. Um, sometimes you hear it uh, like this in its inverted form. And then we have uh, Prelude 16, which is a uh, in G minor. Um, the fugue in G minor is again one of those uh, rather irregular ones. Voices, this one is. Tenor, the answer there. Prelude 17 in A flat major goes like this. And this rather jolly prelude is in binary form. We then have uh, the fugue in A flat major, which again is rather irregular, but rather marvellous as well, of course. With a fugue like this, it's best to listen out for the, uh, the moments uh, where the, uh, the key settles, uh, rather than listening out for an episode. Four voices. Prelude 18 is in G sharp minor. Again in binary form with a coda. The fugue in G sharp minor is rather standard in form. Here's the alto voice. So on. 19 is in A major. And this is another example of Bach uh, actually writing a fugue in the prelude. So you get a fugue and a fugue. Um, a bit like the E flat major one. And actually this is a triple fugue. Um, we have three subjects uh, vying for our attention in the exposition. And it begins like this. The fugue in A major again is rather irregular in form. Um, and in this fugue we have this uh, essential section with these wonderfully uh, flowing semiquavers. Prelude 20 in A minor uh, is like this. Again in binary form, like many other of the preludes. The fugue, the A minor fugue, again is rather irregular. Um, it's best to listen out for the, uh, the cadences in this one in various keys rather than listening out for the episodes. It begins like this, it's in four voices. The 
21st prelude in B flat major is rather improvisatory in nature, again in binary form with a, a coda, and we have a, a, a fugue in a rather a standard uh, form, which begins like this. In three voices. So the 22nd prelude in B flat minor uh, goes like this, again binary. The 22nd fugue, um, this one's in five voices. Um, this is a, a rather wonderful fugue which actually is fairly standard in form. Listen out for the episodes. The 23rd prelude in B major goes like this, again with this rather string guitar-like figuration. Twenty-third fugue in B major is uh, standard in form. Begins like this in four voices. Third voice. Finally, uh, near the end of our whistle-stop tour of the uh, first book of the 48, uh, the 24th prelude in B minor uh, has this wonderful suspensions in, uh, really beautiful. And it's the only one in this first book which has a double bar line in the prelude to signal uh, that it's uh, clearly in binary form and indeed Bark marks a repeat for each of the sections. Begins like this. Rather beautiful piece. And then we're with the final fugue of book one in B minor. And like the fugue of 12, um, in F minor, this is highly chromatic. It really is a glorious uh, masterpiece um, to end uh, the first book. Listen out for the uh, episodes in this fugue. I think they're, they're really beautiful. Four voices. second voice in the tenor. Count for subject in the soprano. Have a listen to this first book of the uh, 48, even if you know them really well, and really uh, get to grips with how they're put together. Bach must have been a wonderful teacher. And if you look at these pieces, um, you can really understand why he wrote that this is for the profit and uh, use of musical youth, and perhaps not just the youth either. <laughs> Everybody desirous of learning, and especially for the pastime of those already skilled in this study, even if you can't play the piano, uh, you know, and I can't play the piano particularly well. They're just great to listen to and to listen to in a really close and detailed way. 
thank you for watching. Again, I've put the just to remind you, I've put the descriptions of each of the preludes and fugues down below, bar numbers, if that's your kind of thing. And uh, please click like and subscribe. And if you've got any suggestions of other pieces you'd like me to talk about, please put them in the comments below. Thank you for watching. Bye.